Thank you, Brother Braylon. Well, welcome, precious ones. It's sure do miss seeing you. We've been apart for a long time, and, and we've put together some things to be able to bring back um, a midweek message. It's hard to be apart at this time, and, and especially so with Easter right around the corner. So if we can, we're going to have prayer together and ask God's blessings. And we're going to look at the Word. And I pray that God will help us to be able to turn our eyes off of, off of the noise, both the necessary clamor and the nonsensical clamor, and to be able to focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ and His eternal purpose that He has for us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You, Lord. I thank You for allowing Midway Baptist Church to exist. I thank You for those that You've brought in this family. And I pray you'd bless them, O oh God. I ask you, Lord, that you would show yourself strong and help us, help us to turn our eyes away from crisis, to see Christ high and lifted up. Lord, you are the one who holds everything together. So we've come to feed on your word. May the Holy Spirit grant me an unction to proclaim it and the hearer's ears to receive it. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done. We pray your healing upon the sick. And I pray, O oh God, for a heavenly revival. I'm grateful for all that our government is doing, but the government is no substitute for you. So help us to see you, O oh God and give you all the praise you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to take a walk with Jesus. We're going to go from the Garden of Gethsemane to the judgment pavement of Gabbatha, to the crucifixion site of Golgotha, and then to the grave. I believe it's a good way to prepare us for celebrating Easter this coming Sunday. The text begins in Matthew chapter 26. They're still in the upper room, and Jesus has just told them that the shepherd is going to be smitten, according to Scripture, and they're all going to flee. And Jesus said in verse 32, But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, Now he's answering Jesus. Hours away, minutes away, from being betrayed by Judas. Watch what happens. And Peter answers and said to, to Jesus, Lord, I can't believe what you're saying, but I know it's true. Of course he didn't say that. What he tells Jesus is, Jesus, you're wrong. He says, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. He just threw all the other apostles under the bus. He said, you must be talking about them. You can't be talking about me. You can't be talking about me. How many times in a sermon you think the pastor is preaching to somebody else and not you? How many times does that happen? It is, it is our sin nature that we present ourselves as better than the Scriptures describe us. And Jesus looked at him. And said, Assuredly, I'm, I say to you this night, this night, right now, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Now you think Peter would have backed up. No way. He said, he said to Jesus, Even if I 
have to die for you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Let me tell you what's happening here. When one person rejects the word of God, it influences those around him to reject the word of God. This whole, this whole time of trouble right now in our country, it's writing each of our life stories. It's speaking to our families. It's speaking to those who live by us. Do we, do we panic or do we trust? Do I live a life of faith? Forgot to turn off my phone. Who's texting me? One of my children. Are we living... Is the story when it's finished going to say, hey, man, I really, I love, I love how mom and dad handled that whole situation. They panicked. They, you know, we, we didn't pray. We didn't trust the Lord. Or do you want to have the story when it's over of saying we trusted Jesus. We got deeper in his word. And we acted as though there really is a heaven if we die. This always strikes me that Peter doubled down and told Jesus, no, you're wrong again. And then the other disciples followed him. And they all said, yeah. Can you imagine that? Jesus is fixing to be betrayed in a moment. And... What he's got is a rejection of his own teaching to his men. It had to break his heart. Then Jesus, verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Now, they've left where they've had what we call the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, and they've journeyed across the brook Kidron, and they've come to the Garden of Gethsemane. And here's what happens. And he said to the disciples, he said to the eleven, Judas is gone. Sit here while I go and I pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, as James and John. And he began, and Jesus began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now, Understand, the other Gospels explain this. They come to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus leaves the others at the beginning, at the entrance of the Garden, and He takes those three with Him deeper inside. And as He's walking, He's feeling the burden of the sins of man that's going to be coming to Him. He who knew no sin is going to become sin for us on the cross. And then He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Jesus is fully God, but fully man. You ever had some friends that you believed, loved you, and would stay with you through no matter what? And at your lowest moment, you find their weakness. Here's, here's the Savior of the world. He said, man, I'm, I feel like I'm fixing to die. Would you just watch with me? Would you pray with me? And then Jesus went a little further. He left them there, and Jesus went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Now, the Bible tells us that he went a stone's throw away. That's not far, guys. 15, 20 feet not a hundred yards. A stone's throw was where if someone was sentenced to death, that the accuser, the witness against them, would take a heavy stone and be able to throw it at them and give them um, a crippling, deadly blow. I mean, think of a shot put, a six-pound shot put. How far can you throw that? 
So don't think that Jesus went across the parking lot to pray. He's right there. They could see him. They can see him, if not hear him. And Jesus went and he fell on his face and he prayed and he said, Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is looking at all what's in that cup, your sins and mine. He's looking at it. And he asked the Father if there's any way that a man, a woman, a sinner can be born again without me going to the cross. I'm open. But if not, you will be done. You know, I've been scolded by pastors from time to time when I was younger. If we were praying for someone sick, I would say, Lord, I'm asking you in Jesus' name that, you, that if it's according to your will, you heal them. But your will be done. And they would say, well, that's, that's, that's a prayer without faith. That's how Jesus prayed. Listen, I'm not God. Jesus was, but he's always an example to me on how I'm to pray. I come and I speak my heart, but I'm going to tell you, unless Jesus returns, every one of us is going to breathe our last in this world. And it's not a punishment when God takes a Christian home. We haven't heard enough about that during this time of crisis. That heaven is not a punishment. And that it is appointed unto all men once to die. And, and I don't know when that time is for me and I don't know when that time is for you. But I can guarantee you this. That when Dennis Brunet dies, it's not going to be by accident. It's going to be by design. By God's design. Because my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And every born-again believer can rejoice in that. But we come in focusing who we are. Because if, we, if we're not careful, beloved, we will, we will approach Easter as a celebration time without understanding and, represent, and, and taking into account who we are. And who he is. I think that's why we can stick so much silly nonsense in Easter. You can call out to folks and say, come and gather. I want to tell you about the brokenness of man and the love of Christ. And the price he paid for the cross. Come and hear it. Or I can advertise on Facebook and say, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt of 10,000 eggs, and we're going to have a couple of iPads in there. Which one's going to get the bigger audience? One is straight from hell, and the other's the message of heaven. I don't care what the preachers say. Listen to me. Jesus comes and he looks at them. And because of how they were arguing with them before, they're not capable. He says, will you watch with me? And then he gets up in verse 40, and he came to the disciples and he found them praying, weeping for him. No, he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Peter the boaster, Peter, the one who believes the word of God applies to other people, but never him. He says to Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? And then Jesus said, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. He's still thinking about them. Isn't that the wonderful thing? No wonder we call him the Savior. I'm afraid I would have been out the door said, okay, I got enough of this. You ever been ready to write people off? 
I'm so glad Jesus was patient with Peter because it gives me hope he's patient with me. And then he went and prayed and he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, let me be honest on this part. The gospel also tells us that they slept because they were weary from grief. They were emotionally wore out. And when you get emotionally wore out, you're not spiritually careful. And so I don't want to be too hard on them because they're just like us. And so Jesus went the second time. And he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, then he came back to his disciples. What happened during that time? The Bible tells us that an angel came and ministered to Jesus. That in his prayer, he sweat drops of blood. That's how difficult the challenge was. They never saw it. They never saw it. It was right there. They could have hit him with a rock. They never saw the angel. They never saw the drops of blood. I wonder... How much we miss during this time because we're so concerned with us. I wonder how much we've missed of what God is trying to do. I believe it's too dark a time in our country for God to not have something fantastic planned. As Christians, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. And to be bold and to share with our neighbors. And then he says to them in verse 46. You ready? Come in because we're going to move quicker. I just want to see it. We need to see in real time what's happening. And he says, rise and let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now it's too late for them to pray. It's a terrible thing when we've wasted all the opportunities and now the trouble is here and it's just too late. And, when his, and while he was still speaking, verse 47, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a great multitude with swords and clubs. And they came from the chief priests and elders of the people and now his betrayer had given them, Judas had told them and gave them a sign saying, Whoever, whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they took him. And laid hands on Jesus. You know, Satan is a horrible, horrible evil. To be betrayed with a kiss, what kind of an evil heart did that man have? You know, you can only be betrayed by someone if you love them. Judas didn't love Jesus. Jesus loved Judas, and that's betrayal. When a husband leaves his wife and breaks her heart and his vow before God and divorces her and leaves, that's a betrayal. It is much worse than being struck by a stranger. It leaves a horrible wound. I think Satan wasn't just trying to put the Savior to death. He wanted to break his heart in the process. A kiss. I think about that. 
I've thought about it for years, and I try to get my mind around it. And so they took Jesus. Now we're going to move. I want us to see as we prepare. Lord, prepare my heart. I can't prepare for a day. I just want to prepare to, to meet Jesus. I want to be able to remember again what he's done and who I am. And that, and that you know what, I'm no prize catch for God. There's some people, man, when they get saved, they strut down, they strut forward in the church like they're a prize catch. Hey, God, you happy? You're lucky to get me. No, he's not. We're just sinners. We're just sinners. It's because of his love that we're worth anything. And so they took Jesus. The Bible says they took him to Gabbatha. To Gabbatha. Gabbatha is the place, is the place where Pilate would meet. And they brought Jesus to Pilate to be judged of men. You know what happens. Pilate, even a godless leader of the Romans, he could see that Jesus was innocent and that this was a frame job. But you know, it's either, it's either the Lord first or it's us first. And so Pilate talked with Jesus. Then he went plead with the people. Then he came back again. Then he had him scourged. He had him whipped. It's a horrible thing. And then he presented him to people and he said, Behold your king. And the Jews said, We have no king but Caesar. And there on that judgment patio, the place of Gabbatha, the people pronounce their own judgment. They said, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They said, crucify him. Kill him! Pilate didn't think Jesus was worth standing up for. You can't be too hard on Pilate. I know a lot of Christians like that. I remember I, remember I was first saved. I hadn't been saved long. I was in college and I was fresh off the bayou and I was in this history class, an ancient history class, and there was a professor there. And I guess the classroom probably had 130 students in it, it the freshman class. And he would come in. I never met a man like that. He was real short and he would come and he'd say, now, I'm going to go into a trance when I teach, and you just write the notes down. And he would say the most horrible things about Jesus. Class after class, comparing him to a cow, comparing him to all these things. And one day, as a young man, not saved that long, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I told him he was a liar. And he looked at me and said, I challenge you to a debate. And I said, how can I debate a liar? And buddy, he jumped all over me. I mean, he just went off. And I, I still remember him saying, he said, I've read the Bible six times cover to cover. And I remember saying to myself, Lord, help me. I haven't read it all the way through once yet. And, and, and he said, there's nothing you can say that I can't change and, and, and show you you're wrong. And I was sitting there and totally convinced now that shouting out at him in the middle of class wasn't probably the best way to handle the situation. And students are laughing and carrying on. And the Holy Spirit came to my rescue. And I said, well, I won't say his name. I said, Professor, you're a smart man. 
You've said, you know my type, sixth grade mentality from the sticks. That's about right. And you can use more words that I don't know what they mean than anybody I've ever met. But here's where the Holy Spirit saved me, just came to me. I said, but sir, there's one thing you can't change. Is I know who I was. And I know what Jesus has done in my life. And you need to be born again. And that man stopped and turned around, turned pale, and walked out his own classroom. In that room of 130 students that had been laughing and mocking me all started to leave. And there were a couple of them. This is the whole point of the story. There was a couple of them that came up to me and said, man, we appreciate what you did. Boy, we appreciate you standing up and speaking for Jesus. And I looked at him and I said, well, let me tell you something. I don't appreciate you, you dipstick. I said, I don't need you to come talk to me now when everybody's gone. It sure would have been nice when everybody was laughing and carrying on if somebody would have stood up and said a good word. Even Christians don't stand up for Jesus sometimes. So don't be too hard on Pilate. And they took Jesus from there, from Gabbatha, and they put the cross on his back and they walked him through the city to Golgotha, the place of the skull. They took him there for him to die. And they nailed him to the cross. Time doesn't permit me to cover all of these in the full way that I would desire. But there were two men that day. Nobody was supposed to die that day. But they were in such a hurry to crucify Jesus that they picked two men who were criminals, deserving of death, to die that day. What a picture. What a picture. And they put Jesus in the middle. Now you would think, you would think if CNN was doing it, they would have put Jesus on the far right. But God put him right in the middle. Why? Because Jesus is always in the middle. He's the point of decision. One rejected. Well, actually, the first guy said, Lord, save yourself and save me. Save us. Jesus never answered him. Never answered him. Why? Because he wanted Jesus' power, but not his person. Hey, I'm in a bad way. Man, get me out of here. I'll be happy for you. I'm you know, and grateful to you forever. That's not salvation. The other man who was cursing Jesus just like his buddy, suddenly his eyes are opened. And he looks a dying man to a dying Savior. And he tells his friend on the other side, We're getting what we deserve. But this man's done nothing wrong. That's called repentance and confession. And then he looked to Jesus and said, Lord, you know what that word means? It means all I know of me, I'm given all I know of you. Not a fancy prayer for salvation, but he's the one guy in the Bible I know went to, went to heaven. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know you're a king, and I sure would like to be a part of that. He didn't know how to say the words, maybe the most beautiful way, but Jesus read his heart, and Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. I'm not getting you off the cross. In just a little while, they're going to come, and they're going to break your legs with clubs, and you're going to die. But this world's not all there is. You're going to be with me. Oh, the place of Golgotha, the place where Jesus suffered. You ever thought Jesus spoke, the Bible records that Jesus spoke seven times while on the cross. The number of perfection. 
the first time he spoke, it was to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I thought for years and years and years, and I still do, of what that means. I think part of what was going on, people, they were happy to be hurting him. If Satan can just get him to hate, if Satan could have just got him to hate, then he couldn't have been the Savior, could he? It was an amazing thing. As the angels of heaven looked down at their king being tortured, they hear the words, Father, forgive them. And the angels pick up their swords and bow their heads because Jesus is chosen. I think salvation was available to every person there, but only one found it, the one who repented. And there on that cross, oh, I'd want to sit and talk about that. But when Jesus said his final words, it's finished. Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. The Savior died. He died so we can live. He became what I am, a sinner. So I, a sinner, could become what he is, sinless. That's why we call him Savior. Where were the where were the apostles? Only one came back. And he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, home. The apostles didn't even claim his body. There was another one who was saved. It's amazing how many champions Jesus has in the shadows. And when the time is right, they just stand up and they shine in a glorious way. Joseph of Arimathea, a believer, comes and he goes to Pilate, the one who condemned Jesus. And he says, I want his body. And Pilate says, OK. I don't think Joseph realized that he was being a part of the fulfillment of prophecy. That Isaiah had said that the prophet had said that the Savior would be buried in a borrowed tomb. And he takes him and puts him in a new tomb and there at the grave. And the leaders go, went back to Pharisees and Sadducees. And they remind Pilate, they said, he said he would rise again in three days. We need to seal that tomb and we need to put some guards on it. And Pilate said, here's the guards, make it as good as you can. It's a bad thing when the lost world believes more than Christians. I think the, the part that I appreciate the most about that resurrecting morning is that Jesus just didn't leave when he saw nobody was there. I wonder what... Oh, he knew what was going to happen. I just can't help seeing it through my own eyes. He resurrects. Who's there? Some soldiers who want to keep him in. Those were the ones. 
And then the angel rolls away the stone and he sits on, on it, waiting for who's going to show up and who comes. A couple of women. Bless their hearts. But they didn't come because they believed they came to do more burying. They hadn't put enough burial spices on them. There wasn't enough time. So they came for more burying. And Jesus loved them. And he looked. And he said, go back and tell them. And be sure to tell Peter what you've seen. Because the last Peter saw of Jesus was when he denied him the third time, cursed, cursed that he ever knew him, saying he never met Jesus. And the Bible says that they looked at each other and Peter walked away crying in the dark. That could have been the end of the story for Peter. I don't know if he ever would have come back on his own. You ever messed up so bad that you just don't think you could ever come back? I think that's, I believe that's why Jesus told them, be sure to tell Peter. I want Peter to know there's a road back. And I want all of you to know there's a road back. So what do we do with this message as we prepare? I've walked you quickly from Gethsemane to Gabbatha to Golgotha to the grave. Let's remember to keep our eyes on Jesus and to believe what he says in the scriptures to yield our hearts to Him, to say, Lord, open my eyes. Even in this dark time of what's going on, don't get so emotionally wiped out that from pure exhaustion, we don't see the hand of God. Allow Him to minister to you For those who've failed, know there's a way back. And that's why the Bible says that those who Jesus loved, He loved them to the end. Precious ones, we're in good hands with Jesus. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Would you open your heart to Him? Lord, I don't want religion. I just want you. I want you. I know my prayer is not going to sound, it's not going to rhyme and sound so, so pretty, but my heart's cry is forgive me of my sins and be my king. And as the thief on the cross heard, so will you. Today you'll be with me because you're mine. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I have barely touched the hem of the garment of the beauty of Jesus. Oh, I pray, Lord, for this day. I pray, Lord, for those who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, that you would open their eyes. I ask, oh God, that for those that are saved, who have been born again, draw us closer to you. Use us, oh God, to touch this world. May your blessings be upon this message. 
and receive the glory from it, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.